Good afternoon, everyone. Roy Oppenheim here with Jeff Sherman for I think our 27th or 28th week. Jeff, you can correct me how many weeks we have now been doing this in a row. Hi, Jeff. How are you? Hi, how, how many are weeks? You? How many weeks now? It's been too many. <laughs> I think around 27 or 28 weeks now. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm losing count. We, it, it almost doesn't matter anymore. But uh, this week, we're going we're to continue talking about foreclosures and evictions and moratoriums. We, we talked about this last week, and, and we got such inquiries from so many people and, and, and calls and emails that, um, as we had indicated, we, we thought it would be appropriate to continue the conversation. And what we're going to do is, as we go through the presentation, we're going to intersperse it with emails and questions that we've gotten from clients over the past week, which leads me to the important thing here, and that is to the extent you have a question or a comment or vehemently disagree with anything that we're saying, uh, feel free to chime in. Uh, this is an interactive process. And, and also, as, as people's questions get sharper and more personal, I want to make clear that we are not legally dispensing legal advice to any one particular party here. Everyone's situation is, also, is always very different. Uh, each set of circumstances is different. So you can't say, oh, we said this at Zoom at noon and it applies to me. No, it doesn't apply to you. What you need to do is you need to inquire further with counsel, with us, with anyone uh, to, to look at your particular situation. But it gives you at least an idea of where you stand if any of this that we're talking about rings a bell. So as we move on, let's, let's go to the next page. Um, you know, our, our firm, is, as most of you know, who are you know, not the first time with us at Zoom at noon here, you know, we're involved with servicing South Florida along with our title company, Western Title, you know, for the past 30 some odd years. But in particular, during the last economic crisis of, of 10, 12 years ago, we represented thousands of people who were in foreclosure, uh, people who were buying at the courthouse steps, people who were losing their homes at the courthouse steps, people who were doing short sales. And all that experience is gonna come back at us probably tenfold now as, as we have to deal with this, with this next crisis. And uh, you know, it's, it's really our pleasure to continue to, to serve uh, you all and, and to be part of, of this process. It's not our choice, but it is kind of now our calling. Uh, besides you know, Jeff, who's my partner, we have my wife, Ellen Pulowski, who's been, been uh, helping put these, pro pro you know, these programs together now for, uh, for six months, and Mia, Mia Singh, our senior attorney, Paula, who's of counsel, and, and Wayne Patton, who helps us with uh, trust in the states as, as well as asset protection planning. And that's gonna get very important, by the way, for those of, the, those of you who, who have to look at foreclosure or other loss mitigation options uh, so that we can plan that way, way ahead of time. So, um, you know, it really depends where you are on, on this curve or on this K that we've been talking about. You know, you have like this, this K where the top part of, of, of the K is those folks who are still doing okay or able to take advantage of, of this economic crisis and those people who are suffering miserably. And that suffering really, you know, is, is something we haven't seen literally in our lifetimes and we'd have to go back to the, to the Great Depression. And so we are here to explain it, try and get you through it and figure out how to, you know, get, get through it in such a way that, that we, we come out of this in a, in a positive, positive way. So let's first briefly go through the economic update if, if we can. Uh, it looks like in, in some ways uh, the consumer prices are starting to increase. We actually had some deflation. If you look at the red at the edge here, Jeff, uh, at, during uh, the beginning of the recession, prices were actually coming down and now prices are, are actually up a little bit up, maybe half a percent or 1%. Uh, or deflation is probably the worst thing that can happen to an economy. And so maybe the worst is over as, as it relates to, to price de deflation. Obviously, you're still having deflation in the energy markets as well as some other particular areas. But, but at least we're seeing some, some comeback to, to the economy and, and hopefully employment will, will follow suit. Uh, here we have shoppers in California, excluding food and energy consumer price index was up 1.7 uh, on the year for the month on a, on a monthly average, which, which is, is quite positive. And food uh, did not drop as much as other parts of the economy because we were buying so much food at, at the supermarkets. Uh, next slide. Uh, and here we, we're looking at, at the change in, in growth and we're seeing, except for food, as like I talked about, the orange line in the recession uh, did not go down as steep as the rest of the economy, but we're seeing that V-shaped. And so again, we have Ks, we have Vs. The Ks and Vs seem to be the, the prominent shapes that, that, that we're talking about here. And uh, again, the V is, is, is part of that, that recovery. Next slide. Uh, gross domestic misery is rising, yes. I mean, that bottom part of the K, which is what we're going to focus on today, is, is, is horrific, and it's something probably much worse than that we're going to have to deal with last time. The only good thing is, is that we've seen much more of an economic stimulus than we saw la last time around. But then again, this crisis is, is, is literally much worse than, than what we had to deal with uh, previously. 
talking about the K-shaped recession where professional workers are largely fine and everyone else is doing awful. And, and so it really depends where you are in the K and how do you get from one side of the K to the other. Industries like technology, retail, software services are, you know, are largely recovered and are, are rehiring. Travel, entertainment, hospitality, and food services have continued to decline uh, past March levels. Ah, you know, I'm not sure about that. I mean, I think they, they, some, some have come back and some have closed, but, but to, for certainly the smaller mom and pop areas and food services and, and in entertainment and hospitality, it's been somewhat of an existential event, unfortunately. The result is that low wage jobs like restaurant staff, transportation workers, and cleaners are least likely to come back. And that's just a, an unfortunate situation. The pandemic update. Uh, I think the, the, the only big change or continued unfortunate change that we're seeing uh, in, the, in the pandemic is that, is that colleges are, are big hotspots. You know, as, as a friend you know, told me today, I mean, what can you expect from 18 to 21 year olds? I mean, how can you expect them to, to behave contrary to their own DNA and their genetic makeup? I mean, they're acting naturally, but they're acting in a way that obviously is at the expense of the rest of the economy and, and, and the lives of their parents and grandparents. And so it's a, it's a very tough situation. And, and I respect those colleges that, that cut back on their, on their footprint for the year, uh, where they're only laying 70, you know, turned away 75% of their, of their campus just to control this. Here we look at the infection spikes in college communities. We're seeing in counties where there are colleges, those counties have, have increased the number of infections compared to those counties that, uh, that, that don't have colleges. Um, next page. Uh, COVID in the classroom, I mean, this is a big issue. Are we going to see a resurgence of, of COVID in the, in the classroom in, in, in high schools, middle school, and lower schools like we're doing in college campuses, or because that's more controlled, uh, that we won't have those spikes? And, that, and that's, I think, something that, that is going to have to wait and be seen. Those high schools that, that didn't properly uh, facilitate you know, proper social distancing are paying the price, but, but other schools have, have learned from that. And Florida, the bright spot, the last three months, you know, South Florida, particularly the state, has done remarkably well. We're, we're better than we were in the past 90 days. Uh, the worst spots are really in the panhandle still, but, but South Florida is doing well. And I think that's because we're all taking this very, very seriously. And that's, that's good for us. And also because I think the weather's going to start to improve and we're going to start spending more time outdoors again. So I think we, we have the wind behind us now for the next six months here in Florida. And I think the North kind of knows that. Next. Evictions and foreclosures. Uh, uh, Jeff, do you want to take over a little bit here, please? Sure. So the COVID-19 bailouts have uh, slightly declined now because the new foreclosure crisis is definitely brewing. I'd say in the next few months, we're going to see, especially towards the beginning of next year, a new wave of foreclosures coming about because a lot of times, um, even with these lenders and the CARES Act, we're providing forbearances for some borrowers who couldn't make their payments. Eventually, they're going to start making their payments again and pay back what they owed in arrears and they're gonna be like, what's next? And so there'll be a lot of foreclosures that are coming up for sure. So, so let me just add here, a lot of realtors are, are, are coming to us at Weston Tyler right, asking if we do short sales. Well, there are no real short sales yet. People are asking because they're expecting that once these moratoria are lifted and people all of a sudden have these huge arrearages, the question is, will the banks take that arrearage and, and turn it into a soft second on the back or are they gonna foreclose on the year's worth of, of payments that have been missed? What do you think? I think they're going to foreclose and I think there will be a short sale market again, I'd say towards the end of next year, for sure. It's going to start booming again. Right. right. So, you know, those people are asking us, I mean, I think it's nice to get prepared, but, but to be clear, you know, you're looking at, at six months minimum and Jeff is suggesting more nine to 12 months that you're going to start to see the impact of the short sales. Remember the short sales really won't happen until such time that the market values drop or in the alternative that people uh, have such large, balances in unpaid obligations to the lender that, that regardless of the fact that their, the, price, the prices haven't dropped, they are not able to meet that, that obligation. But it could be that there could be a bailout program where there's a soft second and the government comes in and pays a, pays a difference or, or just takes the mortgage at the back end and, and then you pay when you, when you sell and, and we'll see what happens. You kick, can, kick the can down the road three to seven years. You know? But remember this last foreclosure crisis was really just ending. It, it was a 10 to 12 year cycle. And, you know, at the very end, right before coronavirus hit, uh, we were still cleaning up foreclosures from 08 to 2010, 2012, 2014 for short sales that were just finalizing themselves. And we're just cleaning it out. And then, boom, this thing hit. Go ahead. Okay. So we're going to do okay. these question and answers throughout the, our, our webinar today. Uh, these are questions that have been given to us by in the last question and answer session that we didn't have time to address. This question is, I've fallen behind on my mortgage as I, uh, as I only collect unemployment. 
I apply for forbearance, but I'm concerned about what happens when it ends. Roy, what do you think about that? You know, I, I, I think there's some concern about what happens when it ends. I mean, as we've talked about, you, you really uh, are going to have uh, three choices. You're going to pay up, which is unlikely. You're going to hope the bank is going to put it at the back end. Maybe you're going to refinance the whole thing. So that's a third choice. And the fourth choice is you're going to end up doing a short sale. And the fifth choice, so I guess you have more than, than three choices, is you're going to be foreclosed. And the sixth choice is you're going to do a deed in lieu. And the seventh choice is you may, you may file for bankruptcy. Did I miss anything? What did I miss? You do a modification also, depending if you're off at unemployment by then, hopefully. But it's going to be hard to show you have the income to support that if you're on unemployment. And then all of a sudden, unless you get a job that's sufficient to pay the mortgage payments. Right. So you can refi if, if, and it's going to be a question, can you do a refi when you're in forbearance or is your credit going to be impaired? So, so refi slash modification is, is, so you're talking about six or seven options. I mean, I think there's a good shot that the government may come in uh, and, and try and, and, and do a bailout program where the, the second, you know, the, we, we create a soft second for the, for the payments that have been missed. So there isn't a, a foreclosure glut. I mean, if you have a tsunami of foreclosures, again, the problem is that that, that takes down the values of all real estate and, and, and has a negative effect on the entire economy. And then you have foreclosures that, that get abandoned and then you have properties on the next door that, that go down in value. And so we learned so much from the crisis, you know, just from 10, 12 years ago, that I think there were a lot of lessons learned on how not to do it wrong. And, and I think uh, a lot of what we're doing this time around is, is a lesson from, from last time. So, so it's really unclear, but I, I do know that you're gonna need good stewardship. You're gonna need not put your head in the sand as many people did, and you'll need to reach out to folks like us to help guide you and figure it out. And, and since we don't know what all the, all the pieces to this game are yet, uh, that we, we can't you know, fully, fully uh, figure this out. But we do know that time is usually on your side and that, that the more you're able to wait, the more tools become available to you in being able to, uh, to figure this out. Jeff, there, there's a question that someone uh, has, has posed. Do you wanna take that before we go to the next slide? Yeah, do you believe that banks and lending institutions are awash in cash? And if so, what would the impact of foreclosures? Um, you believe that banks and lending institutions are a wash in cash. Uh, they may be a wash in cash, but it doesn't mean they want to use their cash. Uh, and and right now, uh, there there are these moratoriums, so they can't they can't begin the foreclosure process. So so it's it's going to really be interesting to see what what the banks do uh, at, at when when the moratoriums start. And we do know that the foreclosure mills, the law firms that that hire up thousands of lawyers to bring these foreclosures, most of those lawyers are still furloughed. Many of those lawyers have moved on. Uh, workers comp or insurance defense and are not waiting around to come back into the industry. And so there's going to be probably a, what, a three to six month lag, Jeff, do you think? How long do you think the lag will be from the time they get the green light to, to proceed with the foreclosures? Like I said, if all these moratoriums expire at the end of December, I would expect by March to see a large filing at that point. Right, right. So it's going to be easily three to, to five or six months before these engines get turned back on. Uh, so there's plenty of time for everyone to figure out what to do. And, and I do recall, you know, years ago, people went back to school, people became nurses, people became uh, paramedics. There were a lot of people that went back for, for quick fixes in their careers. And by the time they came out, they were able to get really good jobs and were able to refinance or modify. And so, so a lot of times, you know, we can buy you the time to actually make a course correction in your own career to figure out what, uh, what you want to do. Next, next slide, please. All right, this is the serious delinquent rate by the Mortgage Bankers Association showing mortgages that are seriously delinquent as a quarter two. Um, as you can see, the US average is about 4.246%. A lot of them are Florida, New York, areas that were heavily hit with COVID at this point. You got Nevada and Texas also. Uh, so it, it's very interesting to see where that is. And it's very interesting that it's really the same places, except for Arizona, maybe, right? Or is Arizona there? Arizona is not one of the darker ones, but. Yeah. So last time around, you know, it was Arizona, Nevada, uh, and of course, uh, Florida, Texas, New York, New Jersey. And so, so we're seeing a lot of the same areas that, that, that were hit last time around with, with, with a foreclosure glut that, that we're now seeing seriously delinquent rates. So, it's, uh, you know, I suspect Florida will be part of what, what is defined as ground zero for this next crisis. Biggest rises in August foreclosure starts while uh, still get still greatly trailing year ago numbers. Mortgage foreclosure activity jumped in August from July as moratorium risk restrictions started lifting and courthouses start to open. Uh, again, the areas New York, Miami, Los Angeles, Chicago, Houston, and again in Florida, you know the courts really aren't fully open. They're they're open remotely. They're not they're not 
really doing full foreclosures, although they're starting to, and sales have just started up again. So, uh, you know, we expect these charts to continue to grow over the next six to nine months. Okay, the next question. I was served with a mortgage foreclosure complaint. What can I do? Don't become an ostrich. Call a lawyer, see what you can do to defend your foreclosure action. Although now that the banks are starting up again, it doesn't mean that they're not gonna enter defaults against you just because it's COVID. Uh, those restrictions are now, uh, for most counties, they're, they're gonna start entering in defaults again at this point. So you need to get an attorney, you need to respond timely. And, and, and as the crisis continues, we, we will do a whole series on, on foreclosure defense, which we're not going to do today. But I will tell you that there are still defenses to foreclosures. Now, the banks were remarkably sloppy and committed fraud, and they did all kinds of nefarious things last time around. This time around, uh, they're still sloppy. They may not be as nefarious. And if they are, they're very clever, and it's hard to figure out. But in most cases, they're still sloppy, and mistakes still get made. And so we know their vulnerabilities, we know their Achilles heel, we know their weak points. And with some luck, the Supreme Court is going to rule in such a favor that when foreclosure defense attorneys are successful in, in defending a foreclosure, that they will again be entitled to attorney fees. For a period of time, uh, we were stripped of that because there was lack of standing, but there's a good shot that the court is gonna recognize from a public policy as well as a legal perspective that when a bank brings an erroneous foreclosure, they need to pay the price for dragging someone through the dirt, through the mud, into court, and then say, oops, I'm sorry, I screwed up, but, I, but you're not going to get your fees because, ha ha, I, I, I made a mistake. That, that may not be the law for much longer. Let, let's see what the court does on that. That's what it says. Well, speaking of mortgage foreclosures and complaints, let's talk about the federal moratoriums that are in effect right now that help both evictions and foreclosures. Right now, the Federal Housing uh, Finance Agency, which is for Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac on loans, HUD, which is FHA loans, and the VA have all instituted uh, moratoriums from now until December 31st. That means it applies to single family mortgages that are mortgage backed and evictions that are where the properties are held or owned by Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, VHA, FHA, or VA. Now, this doesn't apply to vacant or abandoned homes, and essentially, their mortgage servicers are instructed not to file new actions and to halt any actions and suspend them that are in, currently in process. Do I see so the tough part? You know, so the tough part is, you know, and everyone's talking about the renters and everyone's talking about the, uh, the, the homeowners, but, but, you know, it's tough for a mom and pop uh, folks who are maybe semi-retired or retired. They had a few homes. They were relying on the income from their tenants, you know, for them and they'd save their whole lives. They put their pension into, into uh, income producing property. And, and well, now, actually, Roy, I think our next question pretty much addresses oh, what okay. you're talking about. There you go. Okay. Let's do it. I built a small portfolio thinking that I would be able to use the income to retire. My bank is threatening me and I'm falling behind mortgage payments and having issues maintaining the property. Do any of the moratoria apply to me as well? Okay, go ahead, Jeff. I mean, unfortunately for you, none of the actual mortgage moratorium would apply for you if it's a commercial loan. If it's a residential loan, it's possible it could apply for if it was an FHA, um, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, or VA loan but a majority, if it's a private commercial loan, you, there's not that many moratorium or, or ways to help you out there. It's so there's a good lesson. Them. Right, so there's a good lesson here that if you're going to uh, be in the uh, rental income business of owning you know, single family or, or duplexes, uh, that you probably make sure that it's an FHA or, or government backed loan so that if this crisis type of crisis were to happen again in the next 100 years or 30 years or 10 years, that you would be eligible for the same uh, moratoria of your payments like your tenants would be entitled to in terms of a moratoria on rents. And so there'd be an alignment. The problem is when there's no alignment and your tenant doesn't have to pay and you as an owner of the property have to pay, that's where there's a disconnect. And the disconnect is much greater for the mom and pops than it is for the institutional multi-billion dollar banks as, as, as one of our questionnaires was asking about. And they can handle you know, that portfolio risk. They can issue a new bond, they can restructure their financing. So they can go off for a year and not collect income and still be okay. Uh, these mom and pop folks, I mean, this is their retirement. They're, they don't have that buffer that large institutions do. And so this could be an existential event for the income producing small family that, that, that has a small portfolio of, and small could be, you know, a few hundred units. It could be 10 units, 20 units, it could be even be a thousand units. I mean, these large institutions have tens of thousands of units. They can issue bonds. They can collateralize their, the, the rental streams. I mean, small folks can't do that. And so they don't have the ability 
to, to withstand this. I mean, the large airlines can survive this, the small airlines can't. It's gonna be the same mantra. L large chain restaurants will survive, your, your local, local folks won't unless you're gonna do takeout with them. And it's gonna be the same thing over and over again. And this is, this is a, the problem with, with this particular crisis. Well, what I do recommend and is that you obviously contact your bank to see what they could do for you for your mortgage to see if they can help you out somewhat because it can't hurt to ask. Absolutely. All right. Despite the new federal ban, many renters are still getting evicted. So even with the moratorium that's out there, it's not automatic. It doesn't apply to every single type of eviction action. It's only certain types of evictions and you need to be aware of that. Uh, cases that were filed in August, those can still proceed forward even under the CDC. It's not 100% banned just to let you guys know. So residential single family tenants, they can get evicted. So someone has a question here, Jeff. Sure. How long do you think the moratorium will continue after the election? I guess it depends, uh, you know, <laughs> how you perceive the crisis and if and, and if it's a political crisis or not. So, but I think most people think that come January or February, a lot of these moratoria are are just going to disappear and and will not continue. What, what's your thought? I think it'll probably continue, Roy, for certain loans and maybe a little more specific. Obviously, the COVID hit areas. Uh, as you know, they're expecting a, a rise in flu epidemic and, and the pandemic and COVID uh, cases during the winter time in the northeastern region. They're expecting that in, in all over the U.S. So I think there may be additional moratorium coming. But I know at least for right now, even though the numbers are getting lower, we need to see what happens. You know, there's one theory that, that actually if we continue the social distancing and, and, and people wear their masks like they're doing, particularly up north, that this will be actually a remarkably good flu season in the sense that it'll be low for the same reason why the pharmacists are, are slow because people are social distancing and there'll be less spread of the virus, just uh, of the flu, just like there'll be less spread of, of COVID. And so uh, I think maybe there'll be a, a particular response locally, but I think national kinds of responses that the CDC has and, and that Fannie and Freddie have, I think those will probably start to wane because if we look here at this next slide, this, this kind of tells you where, what, what the impact is on the economy. When, when you have entire bans. And this, this comes from the, the Federal Reserve, by the way, and they have great studies and great surveys, and most of it is, is very wonkish, but we like to pull out this, the, the, the surveys that, and pictures that, that tell a story. And this, this story is where there, if you look at the red line with their hearings and filings banned, uh, there have been uh, uh, virtually uh, no evictions, obviously, and the change from, from the prior year is almost 100% down from the prior year. And this goes through July or the middle of July. If we look at the blue one, where there's been no ban at all, and, and where there's no ban, obviously uh, the evictions have continued. But what's happened is, is that the evictions now at the end of the blue line are basically at the level they were at a year ago. And so those particular real estate and rental markets have equalized. And that's very important because if you're gonna have a foreclosure crisis, you can't have eviction bans because you won't have enough rental stock for the people who are being being foreclosed. So if you have a cycle here, it's like musical chairs. The folks who get foreclosed have to be able to move to rentals. And if the folks in the rentals aren't moving because they don't have to pay their rent, it's kind of a problem in terms of the cycle. If you wanna begin the foreclosure process, you're going to have to end the eviction ban. You can't do one without the other. If you do, you're gonna have a bottleneck. And, and that bottleneck could, could cause uh, families living together in such a way that, that during normal times may be great and you know for social, for social you know, communal purposes, but during COVID, it's exactly the opposite. You don't want to have that many people living living under one roof because you, you have a much larger chance of spread. In fact, internationally, the biggest cause of spread, according to the World Health Organization, is families living together. Most communal expressions of the disease have come from family interaction. And so you have to make people living together. So, so this is a very interesting dynamic. And that's why the Federal Reserve is looking at it. And I think this will be a, a policy determination that when you end the foreclosure moratoriums, you have to reduce the eviction moratoria too. And the two have to work hand in hand. Um, next slide. Uh, no job, no rent. I mean, it's, 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 it's a problem. And so, you know, do you just keep it going or, or, or what do you do? And, and that's going to be a, a post-election, obviously, question. I fell behind in my rent in February and became unemployed as I, as I work in the event planning space. Do I qualify now for any moratorium uh, in place, including the new CDC one? Jeff? Well, it, it depends on your landlord for certain things, if, if, um, if it's in a eviction or if Fannie or Freddie owns it. But if it's a single family home, CDC may uh, help you out 
as far as in Florida under the moratorium, they can still file eviction actions right now, uh, as long as it's not solely based on non-payment for COVID related issues. Uh, let me go over the CDC qualifications for you next. So CDC came out for, as of effective September 4th uh, to try and prevent the spread of COVID with this moratorium where they're trying to prevent uh, halt evictions. You have five different factors that have to show that you qualify and only then you'd have to provide a sworn declaration to your landlord under penalties and perjury to prevent them from filing for, for uh, eviction. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to do that, and it's up to the co local courts to enforce those laws and, and see if they're going to interpret them the same way that the CDC Let me interrupt. I mean, if you get a lawyer to do this and you tell them that there's a threat of a 100, dollars $500,000 fine, which we talked about last week, so we don't have to get into so we can do the rest of the questions, and you tell them there's a possibility that he's going to go to jail, I think he's going to call you and you're going to try and work something out. And I, and I highly recommend that if you are in that situation, if, if you can't pay the rent due to COVID, you, you also have to say that you've tried to get some local community opportunities, uh, you know, different cities, towns, counties have money. So you try and get that. And then if, you know, and then on top of it, you send in the sworn statement, you should be able to work something out with, with, with your landlord. We'll keep these up and put this on the website, Jeff, but I yep. want to go through the rest of the questions here um, if I can. I run a hair salon in a strip mall. I always have paid my rent, but my landlord did not provide any COVID relief. I'm now running out of resources to stay current. What are my options? I would talk with your landlord, be upfront with them. It's better to communicate ahead of time before there becomes an issue, obviously. They may be willing to work with you, especially if they've been paying the whole time. Uh, they, it, it, depending on how long you've been a tenant there for and a good tenant, they're willing to work. I mean, I've dealt with many landlords who are willing to work with their tenants during this time frame. Uh, it's just a matter of how they can deal with it and what options are available, and what your capacity is to pay. I think the most important thing is don't give up. You know, always, always, always just keep fighting. Even if you don't have a legal leg to stand on, you may have some equitable arguments. You know, uh, it, there's the, a lot of this is just not your fault and you shouldn't have to accept the, the full responsibility of it. And so landlords understand that. And, you know, and, and the idea that they're going to get another person to replace you at the same rent is unlikely. And, and that person may not have the following. So they're better off sticking with you and you're, and, and you know, if you're running a good business and work something out with you and, and defer the rent, you know, a few years or, or, or figure something out. And we've done that now dozens and dozens of times with, with clients that are, that are in strip malls, running schools, running all kinds of, of facilities, retail shops and, and the whatnot. Next question. Next question. I, I work as a manager for a nightclub and have been unemployed since mid-March. I have two children and am behind on my rent. Who do I contact? What should I do? Jeff? I would obviously contact your landlord, see what you can do to work out something with them. Like I said before, if uh, you're behind on your rent, the landlords are trying to, as long as you make best efforts, I'm sure your landlord, like we Roy said, was that they want you to work with them. They would rather have a tenant in the property paying something as opposed to nothing. Uh, you would potentially be covered underneath the CDC order, uh, but obviously talk to your, your landlord and, and try and work something out is the best way to do it to avoid eviction. Right. Uh, someone says, lost my job now, face foreclosure. Can I hire an attorney if I don't have any money? Uh, chances are you can probably go to local legal aid, uh, and that's probably your, your, your best shot for getting an attorney. Uh, but, you know, the attorneys themselves have to get paid, too, like everyone else for their services and their overhead. So uh, your, your best shot would be to try and find a pro bono clinic or, or a legal aid clinic or, or, you know, just continue listening to Zoom at noon and, and, and do a you know, pro se and represent yourself from the information that, that you're garnering here so you can uh, represent yourself. Again, we are not providing legal advice, but we're giving you the structure from which to view things uh, as, as a lawyer. Um, we are running out of time, I see. I do want to, again, you know, thank uh, Jeff for doing this with me and Ellen for putting this together. Uh, the folks at Weston Title, you know, we're all very busy right now doing modifications, helping people uh, get through this. There are a lot of folks uh, who are buying and selling homes right now and, and we represent a lot of realtors and lenders who are doing refis. And so that side of the business is very busy. And of course the law firm that we gave you a, 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 a smidgen of, of the kinds of issues that we're dealing with on a daily basis now. And so uh, we're very busy there also and, and appreciate uh, everyone tuning in today and, and, and certainly participating with us. We have one chat here and let me see before we sign off. Uh, and someone is saying thank you and it's our pleasure. And so. Uh, if anyone has a particular topic that you'd like us to address, I'll keep the chat open for, for a minute afterwards. And so you could give us some ideas of what, we, what you'd like us to talk about in the weeks to come. Jeff, any final parting words? 
That's it. I really appreciate you guys uh, listening in today. Very good. Zoom at noon with Roy Oppenheim and Jeff Sherman. Thanks, guys. Have a great week. Take care. Bye-bye.